This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 71, coming up on Space Time. NASA's Osiris Rex about to swoop over Australia. Jupiter's auroras present a powerful mystery. And SpaceX conducts its first ever launch of the X-37B space plane. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Australian stargazers will have a chance to get a close-up look at NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft when the three-metre-wide probe swoops over the country during the early morning hours of September the 23rd. The spacecraft will be undertaking a gravity assist slingshot manoeuvre designed to build up speed and modify its trajectory so it can intercept the half-kilometre-wide asteroid 101955 Bennu, which has a 1 in 2700 chance of hitting the Earth in the next 200 years. That's the third highest rating on the Palermo Technical Impact Hazard Scale, a logarithmic scale used by astronomers to determine the potential impact hazard of a near or near-Earth object based on its probability of impact and the estimated damage likely to be caused due to the speed and mass of the impacting comet or asteroid. OSIRIS-REx will study Bennu in great detail, examining its orbit and composition and collecting samples for return to Earth. A key focus of the mission will involve studying the Yakovsky effect caused by sunlight hitting the surface of the asteroid. That absorbed heat is eventually radiated away as the asteroid rotates, in the process generating a tiny but measurable propulsive force which can influence the asteroid's movement through space. Bennu's 1.2 Earth year orbit around the Sun takes it close to our planet every six years, and scientists need to know how the Yakovsky effect influences that orbit and the potential for a collision with Earth. Bennu is a carbonaceous member of the Apollo asteroid group, a collection of over 8,000 near-Earth asteroids with orbits that intersect Earth's orbit. The asteroid was discovered on September 11, 1999, by the Lincoln Near-Earth Asteroid Research Project, LINA, developed and operated by NASA, the United States Air Force and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Bennu is thought to be composed of ancient carbonaceous material dating back both to the formation of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago and even further back to pre-solar system material blown into space by dying stars known as red giants and by supernovae, such as the one which triggered the birth of our solar system. Earth-based observations indicate Bennu has a relatively smooth surface, with a well-defined equatorial ridgeline and at least one prominent boulder up to 20 metres wide on its surface. Scientists think the ridgeline was created by fine-grained surface regolith particles accumulating in this area due to the asteroid's low gravity and rapid four-hour rotational period. Spectroscopic observations of asteroids similar to Bennu indicate its surface will probably contain anhydrous silicates, hydrated clay minerals, organic polymers, magnetite and sulfides. OSIRIS-REx, by the way that stands for Origin, Spectral Interpretation, Resources Identification and Security Regolith Explorer, was launched on an Atlas V-411 rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida on September 8, 2016, on a seven-year sample return mission. The probe will pass 16,000 kilometres over the Queensland city of Rockhampton at 22 minutes past midnight Australian Eastern Standard Time on the morning of September 23rd, travelling south-southwest and reaching the skies over Adelaide at about seven minutes to one local time, before zooming over the Great Southern Ocean and then the Antarctic continent, before heading back into deep space. The Gravity Assist Earth flyby will give astronomers and sky watchers with high-end cameras a chance to view this rare encounter. During the flyby manoeuvre, Professor Phil Bland and colleagues from Curtin University will use their meteor-hunting desert fireball network to develop a three-dimensional triangulated track of the spacecraft's fly path in order to test the network's capabilities. Bland says teams equipped with high-end DSLR cameras will be stationed at key vantage points across the country, working together to track the flight path of OSIRIS-REx as it speeds over the continent. The Desert Fireball Network is a project developed by Curtin University to help NASA unlock the mysteries of the universe by studying meteorites and fireballs and determining their pre-Earth orbits. Bland says together with NASA, the Desert Fireball Network is expanding to form a global fireball observatory through the solar system. The gravity assist will fling the 2,110kg OSIRIS-REx spacecraft towards its August 2018 rendezvous with the asteroid Bennu and the start of its remote sensing science mission. 
OSIRIS-REx will study the asteroid in minute detail, examining its chemical composition and mineralogy, characterising its geologic and dynamic history and mapping its surface to identify potential landing sites. Eventually, the spacecraft will slowly descend to the asteroid's surface. It'll then use nitrogen gas to puff more than 60 grams of regolith into the sampler head fitted to the spacecraft's robotic arm. Meanwhile, contact pads on the sampler head will collect fine surface dust particles during the operation. The landing manoeuvre will be repeated up to three times in order to get enough samples from the asteroid surface. The samples will be placed in a special capsule for the mission's return to Earth in 2023. The sample return capsule, which is equipped with a heat shield and parachute, will touch down in the Utah desert on September 24, 2023, carrying a goldmine of knowledge. Bland says science knows very little about how the planets came together and why the Earth has the composition it does. And the samples that OSIRIS-REx delivers may well hold the key to some of these answers. They do. They contain carbonaceous chondrites, contain pre-solar grains that were certainly formed in the atmospheres of other stars that were kind of part of the primordial building blocks for our solar system that, uh, were, that everything was made from. Um, they also contain, that's right, you mentioned these um, calcium aluminium inclusions. Now, those are actually the very first solids to form in our solar system. And it looks like they formed in the very close to the young sun, probably just within tens of thousands of years of the sun starting to shine. So we can get ages for those. The pre-solar grains are actually too small. They don't even have enough atoms in them to get an age for. But the calcium aluminium inclusions we can get an age for. And they're the oldest solids that we have. So they define kind of time zero if you will, for the solar system. Everything's dated from those those materials. At the start, the solar system was so hot there were no solids. It's kind of a sort of a, a little bit messier than that. A lot of it was was so hot, that's right, that everything was vaporized. There was still some kind of cold, unaltered stuff falling from the top of the disk into that kind of hotter region. And that continued throughout the accretion of the first asteroid. So that's why we have materials that some of it looks like it's been condensed and some of it are these pre-solar grains that survived all of that solar system process. In order for a star to form, firstly, you need the atoms to cool down a lot to form molecules, to form these molecular clouds. That's right. And so so the, the kind of primary, the molecular cloud that sort of predated everything, that was this jumble of grains and gas from loads of different stellar sources. And when we look at those pre-solar grains in meteorites, we see evidence of that. We see dozens of different stellar sources, basically dozens of different stars that contributed to that. A lot of people don't realize this, that universities build a lot of scientific instruments that go on space missions. It's within the capacity of most university engineering departments to do that kind of thing. So on OSIRIS-REx, the spacecraft itself was built for NASA by Lockheed Martin, but then most of the instruments on it were built in university engineering departments. And that's the thing that I'd really like to get into here in Australia, actually. We've got agreements with NASA already that could potentially let us put our instruments on their spacecraft. We can get into that. Australia can have instrumentation flying on planetary missions that we're actively participating in. I can't think of anything more exciting if you're an engineering student going to a uni to know that the lab next door or the lab, you know, where you're working, that you're doing your honours project in the lab where they're building instruments for planetary missions. I think that would be great. And now we've got the spacecraft, which which is uh, about to make a flyby of the Earth. This is a gravity assist maneuver, isn't it? Absolutely, exactly. So, uh, so the function of that is that you can send your rocket up into space and have loads of fuel on your spacecraft and basically drive straight to your target. But that's a really efficient way of using your available mass. Every bit of fuel you put up there is mass that you can't use for scientific instruments to do science with. So uh, mostly what dynamicists, people who kind of specialize in orbital dynamics, try and do is get the most efficient use of the orbits of those other planets and positions of those other planets so you can save fuel. So that's what we're doing here. So the spacecraft has kind of gone out on a long loop for about a year and is now doing a close flyby of the Earth to give it the right trajectory 
to meet up with Banu using essentially the least amount of fuel. And as it passes the Earth, it's flying over the land of Oz. It is, exactly. So, uh, so actually, the closest approach is over Antarctica, but you've not got that many people in Antarctica who can look at it. So, yeah, Australia gets basically the best look at it as it flies past. And it's not going to be kind of naked eye visible, so it's not going to be this, you know, incredible sky show thing. But if you've got a decent lens on a camera, a decent, maybe not even a telephoto lens, just decent lens or a small telescope, any sort of telescope, you'd be able to pick it up. And the Desert Fireball Network will be trying to catch a glimpse of this. That's right. So I've got a whole bunch of people from our project and they'll be going out with kind of small portable cameras. Our goal is to look at it from a bunch of different angles and so that we can calculate its trajectory as it comes over Australia. And then any other colleagues or friends of the project or amateur astronomers or anyone else who's interested, if they get images of it, they can send us that data and we can plug that into to that existing track. So really it's a way of kind of, you know, hopefully getting members of the public involved in a real research project. And they'll all be credited for their efforts. And the idea would be to grab a map draw a straight line from Rockhampton to Adelaide and point your telescope in that direction. Exactly. So basically, if all of the data on where to point, where to look, is on our website, and that's fireballsinthesky.com.au, and you can check that, and that's got all the information that you need. That's Professor Phil Bland from Western Australia's Curtin University. And it's worth noting, OSIRIS-REx isn't the first asteroid sample return mission. Back in May 2003, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, launched their Hayabusa sample return mission to the near-Earth asteroid 25143 Itkawa, arriving at the asteroid in mid-September 2005. Hayabusa spent two months studying the asteroid's shape, spin, topography, colour, composition, density and history before landing on the surface in November and collecting tiny grains of material. These were then returned to Earth and jettisoned in a sample return capsule, which successfully parachuted into the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia on the night of June 13th, 2010. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists on NASA's Juno mission have observed massive amounts of energy swirling over Jupiter's polar regions, which are contributing to the gas giant's powerful aurora, only not in ways the researchers expected. A report in the journal Nature claims Juno's observed signatures from powerful electric potentials aligned with Jupiter's magnetic field and accelerating electrons towards the Jovian atmosphere at energies up to 400,000 electron volts. That's up to 30 times higher than the largest auroral potentials observed on Earth, where only several thousand volts are typically needed to generate the most intense auroral activity. Jupiter has the most powerful aurora in the solar system, so scientists weren't surprised that the electric potentials play a role in their generation. Juno scientist Barry Malk from Johns Hopkins University says despite the magnitudes of these potentials at Jupiter, they're observed only occasionally, and were not the source of the most intense auroras as they are here on Earth. It seems on Jupiter the brightest auroras are being caused by some kind of turbulent acceleration process which scientists still don't fully understand. The new data was collected by Juno's ultraviolet spectrograph and energetic particle detector instruments. There are hints in this latest data indicating that as the power density of the auroral generation becomes stronger, the process becomes more and more unstable, and eventually a new acceleration process takes over. Scientists consider Jupiter to be a physics lab of sorts for worlds beyond our solar system. The ability of Jupiter to accelerate charged particles to immense energies has implications for how more distant astrophysical systems accelerate particles. The highest energies being observed within Jupiter's auroral regions are formidable. The energetic particles created in these aurorae are part of the story in trying to understand Jupiter's radiation belts. And it's these very same belts which pose the biggest challenge to the safety of the Juno spacecraft. Juno's highly elliptical and elongated 53 Earth day orbit around Jupiter is designed to avoid as much of the planet's radiation belts as possible. And most of the probe's delicate control systems and space science instruments are also housed inside a special radiation resistant vault in order to protect them as much as possible. Juno was launched on the Atlas V rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida on August 5, 2011, achieving Jovian orbit insertion in July 2016. Juno's mission is designed to study Jupiter's magnetic fields and its auroral activity, as well as its atmosphere, weather patterns, composition, internal structure and gravitational field. 
All this will help scientists better understand how the planet formed, in the process providing clues about the solar system's evolution. Juno was originally expected to undertake 37 orbits of Jupiter. However, problems with the probe's propulsion system's helium valves have forced the cancellation of a series of shorter 14 Earth Day orbits, meaning the mission will now only undertake 12 science orbits before mission end. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are borrowing principles applied in biology and archaeology to build a family tree of the Milky Way stars. By studying chemical signatures found in stars, astronomers are piecing together these evolutionary trees, looking at how stars formed and how they're related to each other. Think of the stellar chemical signatures as acting as sort of proxies for DNA sequences in biology. It's akin to chemical tagging of stars, and it forms the basis for a discipline astronomers refer to as galactic archaeology. Of course, it was Charles Darwin who, in 1859, published his revolutionary theory that all life forms are descended from one common ancestor. This theory has informed evolutionary biology ever since, but it was a chance encounter between an astronomer and a biologist over a dinner at King's College in Cambridge that got the astronomer thinking about how this could be applied to stars in the Milky Way. Now, a report in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society has looked at how astronomers have developed a phylogenic tree of life that connects a number of stars within our galaxy. One of the study's authors, Dr Paula Joffrey from the University of Cambridge, developed algorithms to identify families of stars in a science that's constantly evolving. Joffrey says these phylogenic trees can provide extra dimensions by using branches to inform about the shared history of specific stars. For this initial study, Joffrey and colleagues picked 22 stars, including the Sun. The chemical composition of each star was carefully measured using data from ground-based high-resolution spectra. Once the stellar families were identified using this chemical DNA, their evolution could be studied with the help of their ages and the kinematical properties obtained by the European Space Agency's Hipparchos satellite. Hipparchos was the precursor to the Gaia spacecraft, which is undertaking a five-year mapping mission of the skies. Stars are born in massive stellar nurseries, deep inside cold clouds of molecular gas and dust. Two stars with the same chemical composition are likely to have been born in the same molecular cloud. A star's mass will determine how long it lives. The bigger and more massive a star is, the faster it will burn through its fuel supplies and die compared to a less massive star. That's why big blue stars live for only a few million years, yellow dwarfs like our sun can live for 12 billion years, while the smaller stars, known as red dwarfs, have so far lived for the entire age of the stellar universe, more than 13 billion years. Because of these varying ages, stars serve as fossil records for the composition of gas at the time they were formed. The oldest star in the sample analysed by the team is estimated to be almost 10 billion years old, which is more than twice as old as our 4.6 billion year old sun. The youngest star in the study is just 700 million years old. In evolution, all organisms are linked through a pattern of descent, with mutations coming to effect as they evolve. Those mutations that work prolong the species. While stars are very different from living organisms, they still have a history of shared descent as they formed in their molecular gas and dust clouds and carry that history in their chemical structure. By applying the same phylogenetic methods as biologists use to trace the descent of living organisms, it's possible to explore the evolution of stars within the Milky Way galaxy. And with an increasing number of data sets being made available both from Gaia and more advanced telescopes on the ground, astronomers are moving ever closer to eventually being able to assemble a single tree that could connect all the stars within the Milky Way. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time.
SpaceX has launched the US Air Force X-37B Space Shuttle on a classified mission. The flight took off from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. Defence Force officials aren't commenting on the clandestine OTV-5 mission and have also restricted launch coverage to MECO or main engine cutoff and first stage separation. Stage 1, pressing 2, liftoff pressures. Falcon 9's continue to 15 flight. seconds, stand by for terminal count. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Is nominal. Power telemetry nominal. Uh, we've had successful liftoff of the Falcon 9. So we're about to move through supersonic vapor cone that forms from the shockwave, if we're lucky. Otherwise, we're coming up shortly on max Q, which is maximum aerodynamic pressure, the point at which Falcon 9 is pushing hardest against the atmosphere. There you heard the MVAC engine chill. Uh, which prepares the second stage engine for ignition. Uh, main engine cutoff is coming up in about 40 seconds from now, shortly followed by both stage separation and then second engine start. We'll be concluding coverage of the primary mission at that point. And my recommendation that second stage call-ups will be performed on LVMs. Watch for main engine cutoff coming up shortly. Miko, stage separation. Stage separation. Now we've had successful second stage separation and ignition. The first stage is currently doing a fast flip maneuver and a boost back burn. The fast flip is to get it headed back towards landing zone one as quickly as possible. And the boost back burn, or to get it in the right orientation to head back, and the boost back burn actually pushes it back towards landing zone one. We've got three engines burning at the moment, though we're in the outer reaches of the atmosphere, so you can't actually see any visible flame. Stage one boost back burn shut down. The boost back burn has now ended. The vehicle is still climbing. The grid fins just opened up. Uh, these grid fins are uh, recently moved to being made out of titanium, which is a much higher temperature material than aluminum, and that's better able to stand the uh, high temperatures of re-entry. Brief spurts of what appear to be white smoke. Those are our nitrogen thrusters, and those control the orientation of the vehicle when the grid fins aren't able to, uh, because there's no atmosphere. Grid fins, of course, requiring atmosphere to operate. First stage, continuing its parabolic arc, heading towards landing zone one, starting to descend back towards Earth. We're still uh, about a minute and a half or so away from the re-entry burn, which is going to slow the vehicle down uh, to only a couple times the speed of sound before re-entering the atmosphere. Re-entry burn coming up in about one minute. The speed of the first stage is still rapidly increasing. The re-entry burn is going to slow that back down, keep those aerodynamic forces upon re-entry at a minimum. The tree startup. There's the re-entry burn. This will last for another uh, 15 seconds or so, rapidly decreasing the entering velocity. Entry burn shut down. Successful conclusion of the re-entry burn. Falcon 9 heading toward landing zone 1. We're about to slow back down through the speed of sounds. Stage 1, APS head stage. Stage 1 is transonic. Coming up in just a few seconds now, we're going to begin the landing burn. That will slow the vehicle down for a gentle touchdown. Landing burn startup. This is a single engine burn, which allows for more control. Descending through the clouds, headed towards the concrete pad. Standing proud at landing zone one. While Defence Department officials wouldn't talk about the mission or what happens next, they were able to confirm that several mini satellites were included in the payload. As to the final trajectory of the X 37B mission itself, NOTAMs, that is, noticed airmen, were issued to pilots to avoid airspace south of the Australian mainland between three and a half and four hours after the launch, and that indicates a likely descent area after two orbits for the Falcon 9's upper stage. The X-37B orbiters have previously been used by the Air Force to undertake research and technology development missions lasting up to 718 days in orbit. 
They're also capable of undertaking intelligence operations from low Earth orbit and even undertaking in-orbit repairs and retrievals of satellites. The X-37 was originally developed by Boeing as a small unmanned version of NASA's famous space shuttle. In fact, it was originally designed to be taken into orbit inside the space shuttle's payload bay and then released to undertake autonomous missions. With the early mothballing of the space shuttle fleet into museums, the X-37B was developed out of the original X-37 to be launched into orbit on top of conventional Delta II rockets without the need for aerodynamic payload fairings. However, all missions so far have used 5-metre payload fairings for the ascent phase of the flight. This latest mission, simply known as OTV-5, was the fifth for the reusable winged space plane and the first to use the Falcon 9 rather than the usual United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. The U.S. Air Force has two X-37Bs, which it uses alternately on classified long-duration missions which can last over a year in orbit. Based on the idea of alternate missions, the X-37B flown on this mission would have been the first of the two orbiters to be flown and would be undertaking its third flight into space. The flight was also the 13th Falcon 9 launch for SpaceX this year, with its next mission slated for early October. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. And a new study has found structural abnormalities in the brain's white matter matched up consistently with the severity of autistic symptoms not only in children with autistic spectrum disorder, but also to some degree in those with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD who also have autistic traits. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry, highlights evidence supporting the theory that common underlying brain mechanisms may be responsible for autistic traits seen in both diagnoses. The new study focused on white matter, nerve bundles that transmit information between brain regions. Researchers say the link between symptom severity and white matter structural patterns was most evident in the region of the brain known as the corpus callosum, which connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres, allowing communications between them. The fact that correlations could be found between autism traits and white matter structure across diagnoses suggests shared disease mechanisms and the existence of biomarkers that could potentially be used to guide the design of more specific future diagnostic tests and treatments. Autism spectrum disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are two of the most commonly occurring pediatric neurodevelopmental disorders. The US CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, estimates that approximately one in every 68 kids suffers to some degree from autism, while the American Psychiatric Association approximates that to about 5% of kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Although clinical overlap between the two disorders is being increasingly acknowledged, the exact underlying brain mechanisms for such overlap remains unknown. For the study, researchers analysed digital images of the brains of 174 children, 69 with a diagnosis of autism, 55 with a diagnosis of ADHD, and 50 typically developing kids. The researchers used cross-sectional diffusion tensor imaging. It's a type of MRI that tracks the diffusion of water molecules in the brain. This diffusion process is affected by fibre density, diameter and myelination, which reflect white matter integrity, essentially for the fast and efficient communication of nerve pulses. By comparing an individual severity of autism symptoms regardless of diagnosis to brain images, the researchers were able to more clearly see brain behaviour relationships, finding the more severe the autistic traits, the lower the white matter integrity in the affected areas of the brain. Sixteen years after Islamic terrorists caused the collapse of the World Trade Center towers, sending clouds of toxic debris across lower Manhattan, children living nearby who likely breathed in the ash and fumes are showing early signs for risk of future heart disease. The findings, reported in the journal Environment International, are based on a study of blood tests from 308 children, 123 of whom would have come into direct contact with dust on 9-11. Researchers found that children with higher blood levels of the chemicals known to be found in the dust had elevated levels of artery-hardening fats in their blood. Since 9-11, doctors have focused a lot of attention on the psychological and medical fallout from witnessing the tragedy. But only now are the potential physical consequences of being in the disaster zone itself becoming clear. Some 2,900 children who either lived or attended school in Lower Manhattan on 9-11 have been tracked through annual checkups. 
And this study is the first to suggest long-term cardiovascular health risks in children from toxic chemical exposure on 9-11. Researchers say the long-term danger may stem from exposure to certain perfluoroalkali substances, chemicals released in the air as electronics and furniture burned in the disaster. The study found that roughly every threefold increase in blood perfluoroalkali levels was tied to an average 9-15% to increase in blood fat, including LDL or low-density lipoprotein cholesterol and triglycerides. The raised fat levels in the blood, especially LDL, are known risk factors for heart disease and can, if left unchecked, lead to blood vessel blockages and heart attack. The new findings follow another report, this one in the Journal of Psychiatric Research back in June, which found raised blood levels of C-reactive protein in people who reported being exposed to World Trade Center dust on 9-11. Previous research linked increases in C-reactive protein to inflammation and higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. The study involved some 641 people whose health was being monitored for effects linked to 9-11. The researchers found that people with raised C-reactive protein had a 12% greater risk of post-traumatic stress disorder than people whose C-reactive protein was not elevated. 2,996 people were killed and 6,000 injured when radical Islamic al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four commercial airliners, flying two of them into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City and a third into the Pentagon building in Washington, D.C., while a fourth was brought down in a field near Shanksville in rural Pennsylvania after passengers fought back against the terrorists who were planning to crash the jet into the White House. A new study has shown that a person's risk of dying is higher if they're admitted to an intensive care unit on weekends. The new findings reported in the journal Critical Care are based on a study of 119 ICUs in Austria. The findings further highlight the complexity of the so-called weekend effect, first noticed in British studies years earlier. However, previous findings from different studies all resulting in the same conclusion about the weekend effect have been inconsistent in terms of determining a cause. In this new Austrian study, researchers took into account the severity of the illness at time of admission, the reason for the admission, the chance of discharge from the intensive care unit to the general hospital or home, and the risk of death following discharge, in order to get a better understanding of the sorts of factors that could contribute to the weekend effect. The study used data on 167,425 patients collected between 2012 and 2015. Contrary to what one might expect, weekend admissions do not alter patient outcomes immediately, but instead are felt further down the line. Researchers noticed that several key interventions in ICU were simply less likely to be performed over the weekend. That suggests that the increased mortality rate is more likely to be caused by systemic issues that prevent the optimum provision of care for critically ill patients at weekends and so raises their risk of dying in the days following a weekend admission. Researchers also found that the severity of illness varied noticeably between weekends and weekdays, with more patients with a higher severity of illness being admitted on a Saturday or Sunday. The case mix was also different at weekends, with more patients being admitted for medical purposes as opposed to scheduled surgery. A bill for a long-held dream of a high-speed East Coast rail line has been introduced into the Australian Senate. The proposed 320 to 360 km per hour railway would link Brisbane, Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne with major regional centres along the route. The first plans for a high-speed railway, known back then as the VFT or Very Fast Train, were developed as an election gimmick in the last century. Updated plans known as speed rail were announced in the early 2000s again as an election gimmick and have become a regular political staple in the build-up to elections ever since. Needless to say, those same promises are quickly forgotten as soon as the politicians are elected. The latest bill would create an authority to begin the detailed planning of a high-speed East Coast railway line, working with state governments in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and the Australian Capital Territory on detailed planning and corridor acquisition. If it's ever built, the line would allow travel between the nation's major capitals in as little as three hours, and it would turbocharge economic development and regional centres along the route. Between Brisbane and Sydney, these would include the Gold Coast, Casino, Grafton, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, Taree, Newcastle and the Hunter, and the Central Coast region. Between Sydney and Canberra, the line would serve centres along the Southern Highlands, while cities including Wagga, Albury Wodonga and Shepparton would be serviced between Canberra and Melbourne. All we need now are politicians to actually get on with the job instead of just talking about it. And finally for now, a new study that's bound to set many tails wagging has found that it's okay to let sleeping dogs lie in the bedroom. 
It's no secret good people love their pets, and most households consider their four-legged companions to be part of the family. Still, many draw the line at having their furry family members sleep with them in the bedroom for fear of sacrificing sleep quality. Now, a new study by the Mayo Clinic Center for Sleep Medicine has found that people actually find comfort and a sense of security from sleeping with their pets. The study evaluated the sleep of 40 healthy adults without sleep disorders and their dogs over a five-month period. Participants and their dogs wore activity trackers to track their sleeping habits. According to the study, sleeping with dogs really does help people sleep better, no matter if they're snoozing with a small schnauzer or dozing with a Great Dane. There was one caveat, however. Don't let your canines crawl under the covers with you, no matter how much they look at you with those big sad eyes. It turns out the sleep benefit extends only to having your dogs in the bedroom, not in your bed. According to the study, adults who snuggled up with their pups in bed sacrifice sleep quality. The researchers say the relationship between people and their pets has changed over time, with many pet owners now being away from their pets for much of the day. So they want to maximise their time with them when they're at home. And having them in their bedroom at night's an easy way to do that, now that pet owners can find comfort in the knowledge that it won't negatively impact their sleep. So go ahead, turn your sheepdog into a sleepdog. And the same is true for pussycats as well. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram... And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.